I think that when we're talking about personalized learning experiences, we're probably perhaps on the cusp of being able to, and I don't even want to say relax though, I would imagine if I were a teacher in a first grade or a second grade and I was realizing that most or more are actually above and not below, then we would have units of study and we'd have the ability to have quality instruction without worrying that the whip, the unfunded mandate whip of just the philosophy behind it wouldn't be there. And I just, I'm trying to wrestle with what would happen if, and I've talked to a lot of people about this, and just to have this opportunity to express this at this level for a committee member, to me, I'm, I always try to wrangle with, what if it weren't the whip yeah. walking for an 18 year old? A version of an idea that I've heard before that's a little differently expressed. And so let me think a, a little bit about how we, how we do that. Um, as you mentioned, you know, this personalized learning standard thing is really, really important. Technology is you know, changing our lives by the day. But in education, it really will, right? I mean, imagine a day in which every school can set a personalized learning goal for students. That can be aggregated together. You can track it in real time. And you can judge a school not by how it did for everybody, but whether it actually sort of made progress for individual kids um, based on sort of where they needed to be and where their parents thought they needed to be, right? Instead of just where the Department of Education of Washington thought they needed to be. And, and that's not here yet. That's still another 10 years away. But you know, that's a that's a wonderful tool. Um, I will just I'll just sort of insert this comment quickly here, which is that um, so I ran for Congress in 2006, and I was just like just a very vocal opponent of the Child Life Plan. I thought it was a disaster for Connecticut. Um, and one of the first meetings I had when I got there was with the Children's Defense Fund. And they came in and they met with me and they said, hey, you know, we want to meet with you because we heard you were a real critic of the you know, Child Left Behind. And, and we know why you are, because in Connecticut you've got great schools. And yes, you've got big achievement gaps, but you've got people who are really trying to do the right thing. Um, but let me tell you what was going on in some school districts in Alabama uh, or Mississippi. The kids with special education needs there, they were spending half of their day with the janitor. Um, nobody was trying to educate those kids. And until No Child Left Behind said, no, you've got to educate everybody. You've got to require everybody to do better. That wasn't until then that a lot of these kids got taken uh, you know, out of the backwater and into the mainstream. And the reality is, is that there's a civil rights issue here, um, whereby um, state school systems um, didn't feel a lot of pressure to provide education to a lot of very poor, often minority kids, um, because nobody was pushing them politically to do it. And test scores uh, and graduation rates for African American students and Hispanic students have just jumped by remarkable levels since No Child Left Behind was passed. There's no disputing that. Now, you can dispute exactly why that happened, but I don't think there's any doubt that that accountability helped a group of kids who had nobody really looking out for them before this law. So that's why I'm one of these guys who says reform it, let's find a better model of assessment, but let's not get rid of that, um, that, 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 that intervention from the federal government that has always been a hallmark of the civil rights movement, the federal government saying, no, states' rights doesn't work for everybody. Um, uh, states' rights is a nice idea for some things, but if states' rights results in minority kids getting treated different than non-minority kids, then we're not that interested in states' rights. Um, that's something that we need to talk about in terms of education. Can we take uh, one more? Go ahead. Well, and the problem's just going to get worse, right? Because the era of defined benefit plans are over. Um, and so everybody that used to have a benefit that they could just count on because they worked for a company or a series of companies for a period of time is done. Think of this scary statistic. More than half of 50-year-olds today have less than $25,000 saved for retirement. Right? So that's nothing, right? That's gone in a year. And so those are people who are going to rely exclusively on Social Security. Um, and there's a lot of talk about raising the retirement age, which works for some professions. There are definitely some professions in which people are working to 70, but there are also a lot of professions. There's still 12% of our workforce that works in manufacturing. Um, those are folks that can't work at a machine until they're 70 years old. There's a lot of people that say, let's just pay out less, let's just cut the benefit on a monthly basis. Um, I'm really skeptical of those efforts because I just know how important Social Security is, especially here in Connecticut. With, with property taxes and high standard of living, you start cutting that Social Security benefit, you're gonna have a lot of seniors in crisis in this state. And we can fix Social Security another way. 
Um, I'll try to exp explain this in a way. I'm not always great at explaining this, but you know, we have a cap on how much of your income is taxed for Social Security Amazing. purposes. Amazing. 100 hundred thousand dollars, about. And that worked for a long time when most everybody in this, when, when most of the income that was made in this country was dedicated to people making less than $100,000. But because you now have this group of people, not a big group, only a couple percentage points of the, of the economy, that are making um, a bigger share of the economy, right? So 1% of the economy, 1% of taxpayers have 20% you know, of the income and they're only paying Social Security taxes on a tiny portion of it, it means that more of the money that's made now is exempt from Social Security taxation than ever before. Um, and so it used to be that about 90% of American income was taxed for Social Security purposes. Today that number is down in the low 80s. Uh, so only about it, like 82% of American income is taxed for Social Security purposes. The reason is is that the millionaires and the billionaires, and I'm not passing judgment, because those folks are only paying Social Security taxes on a tiny portion of their income. And so I don't actually think you need to get rid of the cap. Um, I just think you need to raise it so that we're back to collecting about 90% of income for Social Security purposes. And if you did that, you wouldn't have to cut anybody's benefits. And you'd have enough money to run Social Security for the next 40 years. Um, so I, I'm Listen, there may be a compromise in the end that results in uh, a little bit from column A and column B, but my push is to say, um, in Connecticut, in a high-cost state, um, be very careful uh, about reducing anybody's Social Security benefits. Um, there's another way to ultimately do this. And then we've got to have a bigger conversation, which I'm hopefully going to have. I, so I do a lot of health care work, and I haven't mentioned much about that. But um, we've got to have a conversation about, uh, about um, elder care, about how we care for people as they get older, and, and whether nursing homes, uh, which is what we predominantly send people to, is the right way to go, and whether there are different ways that we can keep people in their homes, uh, different ways that we can help. Um, you, you know, folks care for their parents. There, there's just a better and less expensive model out there that won't suck up so much money, uh, other than the one that we uh, that, that we have. Um, uh, so, um, listen, it's been an awesome cross section of a lot of uh, a lot of issues, and this is why I love this job. Is that you know I get to think one minute about retirement, the next minute about education, and the next minute about you know uh, wage inequality, and um, I just I get all my good ideas from. You know, conversations like this, and I've gotten a few today that I'll take and I'll stew on, and I'll get back to folks on. Um, for those of you that are on social media, um, uh, please, you know, keep up with me on on Facebook and, and, and Twitter and Instagram. I'm, I'm one of the few senators that actually does a lot of my own tweets and take my own pictures for my Instagram uh, account. It gets me in trouble sometimes, uh, but uh, but I do it nonetheless. And uh, stay in touch the traditional ways: letters, emails. Uh, invite me to your businesses, to your schools. Um, I, as I mentioned to some people, I'm unfortunately down in Washington most Mondays to Fridays, but I'm here Monday mornings, back Friday afternoons, often here on the weekends. Uh, I do have that six-year-old, three-year-old that I try to spend uh, as much of my free time with as I, uh, as I can, but um, I'm really eager to get to know Wallingford as a neighbor uh, at a different level than I do today. Thank you, everybody, for coming here.